Anytime you look at the liturgical calendar and see a, a saint listed there, you'll recognize that, hopefully, that it's not only just a day to occupy one spot in the calendar with someone's name or maybe the anniversary on which they had died, but it's supposed to be an opportunity for you and for me to, be, to read the life of that saint, to see what it is that brought that saint to be, come to our attention here, to be canonized by the church, to be, make us assured that that saint is in heaven. And we do so not only just by saying, Saint, whoever pray for us, but by also reading their holy lives and try to imitate some of the virtues that we find in them. This is what the anniversary or these particular dates come up. And today, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul is no different. And perhaps it had been with the observance of the feast days of Saints Peter and Paul for centuries, since the earliest days of the church. Um, perhaps it's been with this particular point that the custom of familiarizing oneself with the saint of the day uh, began at that particular point because I, I don't know and I can't, I'm sure one of the liturgists have said, but I know it was from the earliest centuries of the church within 50 years after Saints Peter and Paul died that they died both on the same day in Rome on June 29th in the year 67, but they did not die in the same place. They did not die together. Um, but with that, keeping that memory what had been done from the earliest times is that when that day came around each year, the events surrounding the lives of these two apostles, as well as the events surrounding their martyrdom, so that they could, everyone could look upon these holy lives, find in there some points of imitation, but find strength that these men, though persecuted, remained faithful even up to the point of dying for Christ. Every year, this on this day, on this anniversary of their deaths, the whole story would be repeated. And that's what I'd like to do today. Repeat the story of, the, of this, what took place on this day so many years ago. Because that's, again, part of the tradition of the church. The tradition here to keep our thoughts alive. And a tradition I hope we will continue, not just for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, let the other days go away, but actually use every other day too to read the life of the saint, familiarize ourselves with it and see how we can learn to imitate the holy life of that saint in any way that we can. We do that, you know, we, we, we do these particular things to admire the heroism of these saints. In this particular case with Saints Peter and Paul, we're doing it not only to retell the story, because it's gonna be things either we've forgotten, maybe sometimes for some people, it may, some details here will be the first time you've ever heard them. And that's just because the anniversary hasn't been kept enough in our own lives to keep that tradition going. And so it falls away. But also what we want to do is answer critics, particularly among the non-Catholics. And our non-Catholic critics look at the things that the Catholic Church teaches. And one of the things they zero in on is what we say about St. Peter, his presence in Rome. We've got St. Peter's Basilica there and so forth. And they make this loud assertion, Peter was never in Rome. <laughs> Crying out loud. He died there. The Romans even recorded the fact that he died there. He, his tomb is there, the big <laughs> in structure that is called St. Peter's Basilica is built right over his tomb on the Vatican Hill. You know, he did die there. How, how they can be so bold as to say Peter was never in Rome, that it's a lie brought on by Catholics. Just understanding parts of the story of today makes them wonder why they go to such extents when it's obvious they're not telling the truth. Obviously, they're not saying the right things. Why go to such an extent and demonstrate that if you're wrong in this area, you've got to be wrong in others. Anyway, there's so many things that can come up with this on so many points to reflect upon. One thing before I get into the whole story of everything here that you will notice for the telling of the story, the anniversary for the, 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 um, the deaths of Saints Peter and Paul, much has made reflection on the life of Saint Peter, um, simply because as we read in the gospel story of today, he was the head of what is called the Apostolic College, the head of the apostles and made the head of the church by Christ. Because of that, his life takes on greater note. And so for all these centuries, much of what St. Peter did, the attempt at martyrdom that was had and we read in the epistle for today, and then the actual martyrdom he went through that we'll talk about in a few minutes, all that is what's brought to fore. St. Paul is not forgotten. There's, there's some things that are told about his death, but not in great detail. That's why tomorrow's feast day is the Feast of St. Paul, because so much emphasis is placed on St. Peter today for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul that the church gave to us many, many centuries ago, a feast specifically 
dedicated to St. Paul and his life and telling of the story that surrounds so much that is there too. All part of the keeping the anniversary, keeping the story of this important saint alive. Okay, that all being said, uh, let, let's go into these particular stories. I don't want to take a lot of time recounting the, 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 the epistle for today, the section from the Acts of the Apostles, in which St. Peter was attempted to be put to death by Herod, but failed. Because I don't want to tell because the, the story of it is there. You can go back to review it. And I would tell you to go also to chapter 12 of the Acts of the Apostles and read further into this because there you'll see there's actually more to this whole story that is important for us to look upon, you know, the, 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 a lesson for us to learn here. The lesson part is that, yes, the apostles and Christians of the early time were under persecution. The epistle takes place in Jerusalem while Peter was there before he went to Rome. Um, Herod wanted to please the Jews and wanted to keep them quiet. He wanted to prove himself, I guess, a good Jew. He killed James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem at the time, also the brother of St. John. And seeing that it did please the Jews, then he went after the man whom they knew to be head, Peter. Had him put in jail. <laughs> and it's not, you know, read. It wasn't just put in jail. Herod became so paranoid, I guess, that people were going to come and try and rescue Peter. Look at what he did. He had him imprisoned by four files of soldiers. I don't, I, I don't know for sure how many men are in a file, but if I can just do a conservative estimate of 10, then that means there's 40 soldiers guarding him, 40 soldiers to guard one man against an organization that was not known for attacking the prison or wherever it was of, Herodi, of Herod to try to get the people out. Besides that, besides having all these 40 soldiers surrounding him, he had one soldier on each side where he was chained to the wall in the prison, night and day, a soldier, two soldiers were there. And then Herod had him bound by two chains. I mean, could the man get away? No. It would be virtually impossible to expect that he could escape. And that's what Herod wanted. He really wanted all this to be accomplished. But he did not know the plan of God. Because it was not in the plan of God that St. Peter should die at that time. Rather, his angel came. And by a miraculous event that's record, record, you know, recorded here, he was released from prison. The chains just fell from him. He walked right past the sleeping guards, right out a gate that opened of its own, went through the streets. The angel left him, but then Peter realized it wasn't some dream he was having. This was truly taking place. God had sent his angel to bring him, to rescue him, to save him. But I want to bring up one point. When St. Luke writes the Acts of the Apostles for us, he just tells one small line that you could probably miss it as you read because you're captivated by the story of Peter in prison and the angel rescuing him and so forth. But why did the angel come except by the will of God? But apart from the will of God, why did the angel come? Because St. Luke tells us that the entire church, everyone, everyone who knew Peter was put into prison, everyone who knew that prayed, Everyone was on their knees praying that he could be delivered. Every person, man, woman, and child, prayed. In fact, like I said, if you go on to the Rex of the Ask the Apostles, you will see that they are still praying as he walks up to the house to announce to them that he's been delivered. Peter was delivered, I am convinced, because everyone prayed. Had people just won away in fear and said, oh, this is hopeless, James is now dead, Peter's going to soon die. Everything's going to fall apart. And then in fear or whatever, just take off and abandon prayer, abandon God, abandon the work. Even that early on that Jesus had set before the apostles and all those who were following them. But they didn't. They knew. They understood their duty in that time of crisis to pray. We'll come back to that point in a few minutes. Continuing on, though, in this recounting of the story of St. Peter. This is important to tell, but it tells us in this particular part of the story of what God had did for him to show that he was not to die in Jerusalem, but his main apostle was to go to Rome, and there he would die. And so eventually, as it took place, he went there to Rome, wrote his first epistle, worked there among the men, women and children, especially those who are the Christian or the Jews who are helping them to understand. He just much, but he ran the church. He started to organize things and take care of things there. We read some of those things in the Acts of the Apostles too. One thing that happens though, as Peter is there and doing these works, several events start to take place 
that are going to bode uh, terrible times for the Christians. One, um, Nero, who was the emperor of Rome at that time, for whatever reason, those from history can remember the story of Nero burning down Rome and he's playing his fiddle while Rome is burning, seemingly not caring, even though he is the one who was responsible for causing the burning of Rome. We know from history that Nero, Nero blamed that accident on the Christians, that they purposely wanted to burn down Rome. And that started the persecution against the Christians that would go on for another almost 300 years. When, when Nero had done that, he would start putting many of the Christians to death. And step by step, they were there. It, it wasn't a big organized persecution, but it was big enough that faithful Christians, wherever they could be found, were being put to death. Others who lived in the catacombs stayed away, whatever. Um, they weren't caught yet, but soon things would start to change. And one part they changed because of a magician from Her Nero's court. Um, the magician, his name is Simon. Simon, magician, Simon Magnus is also what he's known by. He's the particular one that the, the uh, sin of simony is named after. The sin, the sin of simony, as we know from the first commandment, is the buying and selling of sacred things. It is a mortal sin because blessed things belong to God, and we're not supposed to buy and sell them as some point of profit thing. Um, what Simon Magnus tried to do, as a magician, he saw all of the different things were, that were done by the Christians, by the apostles, particularly stories about what St. Peter had done, the miracles he could perform, even raising the dead, curing the sick, all of these things, great power. At one point, he went to Peter and to the apostles, and he tried to buy that power from them. He said, I want, I'd like that power. I will give you whatever money you want so you can give me that power. They said, it's not for sale. This power comes from God, from the Holy Ghost not from any power of man, surely nothing that we can buy and sell. He was offended by that, as we imagined that he would be. So it wasn't too long after that he came up with this whole story that he was going to um, show that he had more power than Peter, the leader of the Christians, did. He was going to prove that. Now, Simon was the magician for Nero's court, like I said. So whatever Simon was doing got the attention of Nero and many, many other people. He announced a date that he was going to prove to everybody he had all this power. Date came. Simon is there. People start to show up. Christians are coming. They want to see what's going on, what will happen with this pagan. The pagans are coming. Nero, I don't think Nero necessarily was there, but he sent representatives. And they were following to see what would happen. Simon announced that he was going to fly up in the sky. He had that power, power greater than Peter himself had. And so he was getting ready, whatever he do, he just kind of looked like I was seeing him on the side going, I'm getting ready to fly. And then, poof, he took off. Now, the devil is an angel. The devil has power. He can do whatever he wants. And so there he was, rising up into the sky. And people started to wonder, boy, he really does have more power than Peter. It really is possible for him to have much more power than Peter could ever claim to be. I don't know if it caused some doubts in the Christians' mind, but the pagans were saying, whatever we heard about the Christians, this power is greater than theirs. Until about that time, just a few minutes after he got into flight, something started to happen. And Simon quickly came and turned back to the earth, and he came down a loud, loud crash in a house, a lodge that next to belonged to Nero. Nero wasn't there at the time, but it belonged to Nero. Simon died as a result of that. But word quickly went around that this was caused by the Christians as an insult to Nero. The Christians had this power that while Simon was up in the sky, they did something like that and caused him to come down and crash and try to kill Nero. And after all, this was Nero's magician and it came right down on Nero's house. So it looked like the Christians were trying to insult Nero, which increased the persecution against the Christians but especially that of Peter. He was the one in charge. He was the one they thought was insulted by what Simon Magnus wanted done. So the word was out to find Peter. The people around him tried to convince Peter to leave because his work, his help was needed, his work was still needed in the church and all these things. So he was leaving from Rome along the city along what was called the Appian Way, the several roads that lead into and out of Rome. One of these is the Appian Way. Peter is on there with some people. 
as Peter is probably a mile or so outside of the city of Rome, he sees someone coming toward him, someone he recognizes. It's Jesus Christ. He is absolutely astonished. And Jesus is heading toward the city, not away from the city, into the city. Peter stops him and asks him, Lord, where goest thou? <laughs> In Roman tradition, there's a church right there on that very spot, the church of Dominus Quo Vadis. Lord, where, where are you going? Where goest thou? There's a church there. Our Lord answers Peter. He says, I go back to Rome to be crucified a second time. Peter knew at that moment that this was the time that Christ had foretold to him many years before when he said to him that there will come a time in your old age that some will come and lead you by the hand to a place you will not want to go. He understood that that place, the people who were going to be leading him would be the Roman soldiers and the place he would not want to go would be the place of his death. Peter knew his place was not to go out of Rome but to turn around and go back because Jesus was telling him this was the time for his death, for his martyrdom. And so Peter did. Peter went back into Rome. He started to get things ready. He wrote the second epistle. As you read the second epistle, you find instances recorded in there about his upcoming death. He uh, selected his successor in the papacy, Clement, who was also well known by St. Paul. People loved and respected this man. Peter um, not only chose him, but the, according to the earlier ceremonies, it consecrated him, gave him the power that he had to be his successor as the head of the church and to oversee things. Also, um, at that particular time, um, Peter had heard that his wife, uh, remember Peter was married, we find that in the scriptures, um, that he had been married, but he was celibate ever since he started to follow Christ. He, his wife never had um, relations after that. She went with other holy women and ministered to the needs of the apostles in Jerusalem and even on into Rome. But she never lived together with Peter anymore after that event when Peter went to follow Christ. But Peter still have, you know, a love and respect for her. When he found out that she was about to be martyred, he went to visit her and encourage her in the martyrdom and encourage her to know that her time to meet with Jesus once again would soon be there. And they, he, they, her, his words to her were a great benefit to her, were very much welcomed. But others who knew that Peter went to do that, St. Paul calls these people false brethren. These people... For whatever reason, there's always factions that go on in, in, in any good society that can take place. Whatever the reason might be, jealousy, envy, who knows. But there was a group of people that turned Peter in to the Roman authorities. He's here. He's there visiting his wife right now. You can capture him. That's how the, the Roman soldiers found it so easy to capture Peter. And they did. They captured him, brought him into prison put him in there with, you know, uh, as the Romans would do and all those particular things there. On June 29th, the year 67, Peter was given his final sentence of being put to death. Because he was not a Roman citizen, his death would be by dying on the cross. To die on the cross was, is the most shameful death, according to the Romans and most other people. And so this is why the Romans would crucify him. Peter welcomed the thought of being crucified. All he asked was, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my master was. Nail me to the cross, but turn me upside down. The Roman soldiers said, fine, if that's what you want, that's how you'll die. And that's exactly how he died. He was led outside the city gates in front of this big obelisk that was um, dedicated to one of the Roman gods, Apollo. Peter was made to face that, to show that Apollo was greater than he or his god that he preached. Where Peter found himself was on top of one of the hills that had been kind of desolate at the time, but now is famous. It's the Vatican Hill. This is where he was put to death, and his body was placed there, and centuries later would be dug up, and the whole monument to him and his work was there, as we see in the pictures of St. Peter's Basilica. At the same day, across the river Tiber, so in a different place but on the same day, St. Paul is going through a condemnation to death. He has been in prison, but another prison, a different prison. Nero had found him, another leader among the Christians. Nero had found him. Maybe false brethren betrayed him too. We don't know. 
Nevertheless, he found himself being sentenced to death too. But remember, Paul is a Roman citizen. Roman citizens are not crucified. No matter what they've done, they are not crucified. That's left for people who are not Roman citizens. Roman citizens that are going to be put to death are beheaded. And the beheading is not like you might see of some guillotine coming down or some head placed on a chopping block. To have be beheaded is like what you probably have seen news stories about terrorists have done the past few years. Or somebody just left to kneel right there and somebody with a strong sword and a strong arm just cuts the head right off. St. Peter was taken out on the Ostian Way, another one of the roads leaving outside of Rome, two miles away from the center. He walked away, they took him away about a two mile distance there. He was made to kneel down and he was praying. He began to pray. They blindfolded his eyes as they customarily do at the time of execution. The soldier stepped back and put his soldier, his, his sword rather, through the neck of St. Paul and his head was severed from his body. According to the custom as we understand, the tradition that is set up, the head not only fell to the ground but it bounced three times and immediately three springs of water came up. Those three springs of water are still flowing to this day in the church area, the whole district of the port called the Church of St. Paul outside the walls. So many things, the miraculous things that have taken place here. St. Paul, as is often referred to in the, in the, the church's liturgy in, in addressing him, was called a vessel of election. He wasn't among the original 12 to be called, but he was called by Christ and studied under him for three years in the desert before he went forth in his public ministry. He preached the gospel in many ways and helped in so many things for the early church. He was called to be an apostle, a vessel of election that way, but he was also a vessel of election to be a martyr. And it was something that he desired. You read his epistles and you can see martyrdom was not something he ran away from. He desired to be dissolved and to be in Christ, with Christ, to imitate him in any particular way. St. Paul's life completed in this way is a true story of a heroic act the best of all conclusions that can take place in a Christian sense. Oh yes, people who die and die peacefully in God, they, feel they end their life in a good way too. But to, lead, to, lead, to, to end your life living in such a way that you are saying to God, I so love you, I will not abandon you even when people threaten to put me to death. That I am willing to die, to shed my blood, to prove that I love thee, that I will not offend thee, I will not betray thee. And that's what we see in the lives of Saints Peter and Paul. And this is why this anniversary story is told every year over and over and over again. It has been done for centuries since at least the year 100. That on this day we could bring back to mind the glorious martyrdoms of these two great saints, how they died, the spirit in which they were there, being assured that they would pray for us now that they had gone on to heaven and what heroic virtues that they possessed that we pray that we too can at some point be able to imitate. You can imagine what fear spread among the Christian people when they heard. There are two great leaders of Christianity dead in one day. Peter martyred on a cross upside down. Whether well, people understood at that particular point that that was his request, I don't know. But they just thought that was a very indignant manner in which the, the soldiers had treated him at the very end. Paul, having died by his being head being beheaded, both on the same day being struck down. You can imagine that within the church there in Rome and as the news just spread like wildfire, wherever Christianity had spread by that time, that it would seem like everything was hopeless now. Everything was coming to an end. Paul was gone. Peter was gone. The very reason for the existence of the continuation of the church, the leadership there, has gone away. Is it possible for Christianity to even continue? There were people at those, that time who did have those doubts, just hearing upon the death of Peter. We can look back centuries later and say, they were weak in their faith to doubt that much that God's church could not be stopped even by the death of Peter and Paul. We can say that today, but imagine yourself in that time and what they were suffering with that and the doubts would have come their way. Wondering even, is it possible that this church that Christ had founded on Peter would continue? 
It's almost like the language of people today, isn't it? The crisis that we're in in the church. The crisis that comes forth and says, we have what is being taught to us from modern Rome. The, the way that the modern churches, the game that they were Catholic is still attached to them, but the errors, the heresies that are coming forth from them that there's, there's no authority, no leadership in any way in all these particular things that's taking place. None of that exists right now. But error is being taught in the name of Catholicism, in the name of the leadership of Catholicism, leading souls astray. False brethren have now once again enchained Peter, if you will, enchained the works of the church, enchained in such a way that it seems like it is impossible to think the church will ever continue on, that it's going to die right here, right now. We look at the people of the early centuries and we say they didn't have enough faith. Then who are we to say something different? Who are we to come along and say, I'm afraid, I can't do it, the church is coming to an end. There is no possible way God could bring the church back because of all these things that are everywhere. The world has to be coming to an end because it just won't happen. God's church will never come back. Who are you, prophet? Who are you, one who says that God cannot bring his church back because it is his church? That God will make everything continue to live even when the darkest of times seem to fall upon it? What brought Peter out of the prison in Jerusalem? God's will, yes. But everybody prayed. That's what made the difference in Jerusalem. Everybody prayed. Men, women, children. As St. Luke says, they did not cease to pray for him until Peter was delivered. Oh, but Father, it's been almost 40 years since Vatican II. You expect me to pray every day? You should have been praying from day one. From the first day you realized there was a problem. You should have been, should have been praying. Praying for the deliverance of the church. Take Pope Leo XIII's prayer that we pray after Mass every day. Invoking the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, Saints Peter and Paul, and all the saints. For the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. Her liberty, her freedom. For being made to be known among men in society that she is the church of Jesus Christ and people will respect that. A hundred years ago, Pope Leo XIII composed that prayer because it was politics that imprisoned the church, mostly in Italy, not necessarily to the rest of the world. Now we have that it's heresy that's imprisoning the church. They will never go, the church will never disappear. We have the promise of Christ and the gospel to Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I don't care how much heresy seems to be spreading. I don't care how much it seems to be present everywhere. I don't care if they are the majority and we are a minority. The gates of hell will not prevail. That's the promise of Jesus Christ, and he will not lie. But why does it seem that it keeps prevailing and prevailing for such a long period of time and for all we know is going to continue to prevail year after year? It's because you and I are not praying. We haven't learned the lesson of Jerusalem to pray without ceasing that Peter can be unchained, that the church <coughs> can enjoy her peace and liberty, that heresy can be overcome. And if you become one of those people who says, it's impossible, Father. Then I refer to you to what the Archangel Gabriel told to Mary. Nothing, nothing is impossible with God. But because we don't pray, eh, it's impossible. God will not do it. God will not move until he sees that we're worth it, until he sees that we're doing the duties that we need. Instead of having this prayer after Mass just being blown off as another prayer, just listening to words being recited as if they're not important. They are important. They're supposed to set our hearts and minds every day until God restores the public authority in his church. They're supposed to set our minds in that every day for the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. And if we don't pray that way every day without ceasing, making it a part of our intentions of prayer, making it a part of the reason why we make sacrifices every day, if we don't, the church continues to suffer. Souls are not saved. 
the good work that could be done is not being done. And don't blame God. Because we have not learned the lesson of Jerusalem to pray without ceasing for the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. That's what's set before us today, to pray unceasingly. We, we, we've heard the story. The anniversary has been re-brought brought back to us, but there's that greater lesson to learn today, the greater lesson that is here. Society needs the teachings of the church, the teachings of Peter, the true teachings, not that false stuff that's out there. Society needs the true teachings out there to bring it back to itself, to its senses, and to save souls. But it's not coming forth because you and I are not praying. You and I are not sacrificing. God is not moving to bring his church to where it could be because we are not doing what we should. Let us be resolved on this day, please, to understand this our duty, and everyone, everyone take up this duty. And understand that it's going to be a duty that has to be fulfilled every single day until the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother of the Church takes place. Every single day. No excuses, no laziness, no fearfulness. Every single day. If we, are, if we persevere in this effort, God will move. Herod tried to keep Peter in prison with an, un, <laughs> an unbelievable amount of men. It didn't work. The devil is trying to keep the church down today through heresy and so many other things. It will not work. It is God's church. But it's going to be up to us to pray. Let's do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.